Looking at John, the 21st chapter, first 14 verses, Richard read this earlier in the service. I'm not going to read it again, but I'll be making reference to it as we move through the message this morning. In this passage in John 21, after Jesus had come back from the grave, and it tells us at the end of this this passage that he read in verse 14, this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. But in this passage, Jesus reminds his, his disciples of their calling. And he gently reminds them. He does, he's not harsh, but he, he's firm and he's gentle. And then this evening I'm going to preach on the next section, beginning with verse 15, through the uh, several verses more where he reinstates Peter after Peter's, Peter's denial and, and all these things that happen. And so I want us to think of ourselves and God's call in our lives because every Christian has a call. It's not just pastors who are called. It's not just missionaries or evangelists. You have a call. You have a calling from God. Something to do in the kingdom of God and it has to do with feeding sheep. We are sheep. We are his sheep. And it has to do with feeding sheep. Every every Christian has a call. You have something to do for God. So I want you to think about it. Uh, we all have spiritual gifts. It's not exactly the same as a talent. God gives gifts. Sometimes he gifts people with things that they don't think they can do. Uh, you've all heard, many of you have heard of Uncle Buddy Robinson, uh, one of the early preachers in the Church of the Nazarene. Nobody would have ever thought he could be a preacher because he stuttered so much that people could not even understand. He couldn't carry on a conversation with people. They couldn't understand him when he talked. Who would have ever thought that he would be called to be a preacher? But God called him, and he was a very effective preacher, and they said when he stood behind the pulpit, he didn't stutter. And I've known some other men, one of Gail's pastors, Ralph Fisher, who was also... I knew from Michigan, and then he went to North Dakota, and he pastored the church that Gail grew up in, in Bismarck, North Dakota. He stuttered, but he all, but when he got up to sing, he didn't stutter. And most of the time when he got up to preach, he didn't stutter. God calls people, sometimes the unlikely, to do things for him. So don't think that just because you're not gifted in some area that God hasn't called you to do it. You might not be a gifted speaker, but God might want you to speak for him. It might not be a preacher. He might want you to witness. He wants us all to be witnesses. And so I want us to look at this passage of Scripture and see how Jesus reminds His disciples of their calling. And I want you to relate it to God's call in your life. It's an old cliche, but I believe it is true. When God guides, He provides. Do you believe that? When God guides... He provides. Oh, we've probably heard this many times before. And as I said, it's kind of a cliche. But it's true. I can vouch for that in my own life. Because God called me to preach out of a family of, with seven children and a father who couldn't afford to send me to college, couldn't afford to pay for it. And uh, I didn't know if I, could, if I would graduate from college. I wasn't a particularly good student in, in high school. I wasn't particularly interested in studying. But after God called me, I began to take on a new interest. I graduated from college, also from seminary. But it was with God's help because God, when He guides, He provides. And I want you to see this this morning and see how God reminds His disciples of their calling. In this third appearance of Jesus to his disciples, as I've said, he reminded them of their calling. And in Matthew 4, 18 through 20, Jesus called Peter and his brother Andrew from their lucrative and secure vocation as commercial fishermen. You might have thought, well, just a fisherman, he's just a common person. That wasn't much to leave to go to uh, follow Jesus. Yes, it was. That was probably a very lucrative profession for his, his time. They were fishermen, and they knew how to do it. They were good at it. And God called them, and he said, 
I'm going to make you fishers of men. Listen to what he said. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will make you, you remember what he said? Fishers of men. Fishers of men. He said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And then it says, at once they left their nets and followed him. That's in Matthew 4, 18 to 20. Now, with that in mind, I want us to look at this passage in John 21 and see how Jesus reminded his disciples of their calling. He reminds them with what might have been an embarrassing situation. I have noticed that when, when I'm in the kitchen here at the church or any kitchen, and there are women in the kitchen, they don't want me telling them how to do things. Do you blame them? Come on, women. You, it's true, isn't it? You don't want me telling you how to do things, right? She says, I do anyway. I do a lot of the cooking at home. I can do all right. I can cook pretty good. She said that because she wants me to keep doing it because I do the dishes too. A lot of the time. But you know, if you're good at something, you don't want somebody else coming along telling you how to do it, right? Right. Jesus is a carpenter. His dad was a carpenter, and so he was following in his father's footsteps, his earthly father. And he was a carpenter. Here are some fishermen. They know how to fish because they that's what they do for a living. But after the resurrection, they have gone out to fish, and they fish all night, and guess what? They didn't catch anything. Why? I think one of the reasons they didn't catch anything was so that they could learn a lesson about trust. And so that they could learn a lesson from Jesus and be reminded of their call. They're out there and they fish all night and they don't catch a thing. And I imagine they're wondering why and they're disappointed. And somebody from shore calls out in a loud voice, Hey, have you caught anything? Well, maybe, I don't know if he's rubbing it in a little bit, but they haven't caught anything. No, we haven't caught anything. And listen to this. A carpenter says to these fishermen, Throw your net on the other side of the boat and maybe you'll catch something. And Peter, the impetuous person that he is, probably thinking to himself, how does he know anything about this? Um, we've been fishing all night. Throw your net on the other side of the boat, and you're going to catch something? Most fishermen, if they're fishing in a certain area, they don't catch anything. They go to another area, right? You don't just throw your net on the other side of the boat. But he tells them, throw your net on the other side of the boat, and they catch such a haul. It tells us here it's 153 fish. And they're surprised that the net doesn't break. There's so many fish. So here's a fisherman fishing. There's some fishermen fishing all night and catching nothing. And here's a carpenter who's called them to be fishers of men who says, throw your net on the other side of the boat and you'll catch something. And they do. And then they recognize that it's Jesus. And they go to shore. And guess what? Jesus is already cooking some fish for them. And I think by that, he's also saying, uh, I could have provided for you. You're fishing all night to catch some fish, so you can have some breakfast, and so you can sell some of them and make some money. And they didn't catch anything, but Jesus says, throw your net on the other side of the boat, and they do. Then they come to shore, and he's already got fish cooking on fire there on the shore. And then he says, come on, let's have some breakfast. And he says, bring some of those fish you caught, and we'll put some of those on the fire too. A fisherman tells, a, a carpenter tells some fishermen to throw their net on the other side of the boat, and they catch some fish. And I suppose that could have been a rather embarrassing situation for them, right? But I think in, the, in doing this, he's reminding them of their call. He's saying, now, don't you remember... I called you to be fishers of men. I called you away from the security of what you were doing to the insecurity. I suppose in a human, from a human standpoint, it would be insecurity to do what I'm telling you to do. I want you to go out and win people. 
people for me. I want you to tell people about my life and my teachings and about my death on the cross and my resurrection from the dead so that they will turn and follow me too. Like you are, or at least have been. But after the resurrection, they kind of got off track a little bit. Now, I don't know that it was wrong for them to ever fish again, but they weren't supposed to do that as their li for their livelihood and as their vocation now. They were now supposed to be full-time preachers and teachers of the gospel. So Jesus reminds them of their call by, by this little lesson about fishing. And then he reminds them of their calling by providing this catch of fish and a meal. The God who calls us will provide for our needs. Do you believe that? Yes. The God who calls us will provide for our needs. All through my ministry, I can testify to this. I can look back at, at the, how God has worked in our lives. As I said, when I went to college, I didn't have the money to pay for college, and I didn't have a family that could afford to pay for my college. I had to borrow money. I got some grants. I worked all the way through. Didn't make very much money working on campus, but I worked all the way through to get a little extra money. When I got out of college, I still I owed money for my college education. I paid it all off, never missed a payment, and never had a late payment, thanks to God and His provision. But when I graduated, I went into the ministry. I started out with a little home mission church that paid me $40 a week. $40 a week, how could you live on that? Well, that was about 40 some years ago, so it's a little better than it would be now. But the district also pitched in and they gave me another $40 a week. That still wasn't enough to live on. So Gail went to work and taught school. She taught home ec and English. And thank the Lord, she, her income was more than mine and it helped us. And it helped us to save up money so that when, when the time came for me to go on to seminary, I could leave that place where God had called me and where I'd served for three years and go on to seminary. Now, there was nobody to pay my, my travel expenses because I wasn't going to another church. I had written and, and inquired about pastoring a church there, but there were so many preachers in, in Kansas City and so many of them better and much more experienced than, than I was that I, could, I didn't get a church. So we moved on to Kansas City, bought a house there, got jobs there, but along the way, I could just see every step of the way how God was providing for us. It's amazing how when God guides you, He will provide for you. And I believe Jesus was teaching these fishermen a lesson in trust. The God who calls us will be there when we need Him. The God who calls us will keep us in His care. And the God who calls us will reward us for obedience. Do you believe that? Amen. God provides in a marvelous way when we follow, when we obey Him. Are you obeying Him? If you obey Him, you will see God's hand at work in your life. But you can't, you have to take steps of faith. All through the Bible, stories about faith, uh, they didn't have, God, God led them one step at a time. Do you, do you remember the story about how God was going to leave, lead the children, how, how He led the children of Israel out of Egypt? They had to get right up to the, the Red Sea before the, the waters parted and they could go across. The same was true when they went across the Jordan River. Do you know that they literally had to actually step down, and it was at flood stage at the time. They literally had to step down up in, into the river. They had to start stepping down into the river onto some rocks that were there before they could actually walk, before the waters actually parted to walk across. Sometimes we can't see ahead of time. We just have to trust God and take one step at a time by faith and see how God will part the waters, how God will make a way, how God will provide for us, but we have to take a step of faith first. Have you ever had to do that? Have you ever had to take a step of faith before you saw God at work in the situation? Well, it will happen in your life if you haven't seen it happen before. But you have to trust God. You have to believe Him. And just as these disciples obeyed God and threw their net on the other side of the boat, even though some of them were probably skeptical about whether they were going to catch any fish, 
If they'd been fishing all night and didn't catch anything, and they were told to throw their net on the other side of the boat, they were probably a little bit skeptical. But they did it. And there were results because they did it. And you will see results in your life if you will be obedient to God. Amen. But you have to trust Him. And it won't always be easy. In Matthew 19, 28 to 30, we read these words. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake, listen to what Jesus says here, will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. There, Jesus says to his disciples, those who have left uh, their families and their fortunes and all of the things that they that gave them a sense of security, they've left those things for my sake. It's not just leaving them, it's leaving them for Christ's sake. For the sake of his call and his gospel and obedience to him, he says, they will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life hundred times as much. It'll be material things. It'll be physical blessings. It'll be spiritual blessings. It'll be in the future and it'll even be in the present. Because in one passage, he says that that will happen here and in the future both. He says in this life. So it's not just a pie in the sky by and by, like some people refer to heaven. It's not some kind of something just for the future. And I don't believe that it's pie in the sky by and by. I believe in the reality of a future life. I believe there is a place, the Bible tells us about it, where we're going to spend eternity with Jesus and with our loved ones who've gone on before us, who are the Lord. But we have to trust. The rewards will also be in this present age. I told you that, and I said there's another passage that expresses that. That's in Mark 10, 29 to 30. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much. And here he adds, in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields. And with them, he also says, persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. So there, he says, you'll get blessings here and blessings in the future life as well. It'll be both. And, and can't you agree with me this morning that when you serve God, that there are blessings in this life as well? Yeah. It's not just all in the future, is it? It's here and now, too. And it may not be all the things we, we want or we, or we think we ought to have, but God will bless and he will take care of you. And he says, and there will be hardships and persecutions along with it. The third thing is this, as to how he reminds them of their call. He reminds them of the nature of their call in verses 15 and following. Now, I didn't, we didn't read that passage. But if you go on, and I'm going to preach from that tonight. If you, after these first, first 14 verses in this 21st chapter of of Matthew, of John, if you read from 15 on, you'll find some more about the call. And I don't want to give away my sermon for tonight, but some of it, uh, I'm going to say now, he, he reminds them of the, of the nature of their call, and he also reminds them of the sacrifices to be made, and of his continued presence and help as they follow him and obey his call. Now, if you're taking notes, I know that's a long, long, a lot of words for one point. But I'll, I'll say it one more time. He reminds them of the nature of their call in verses 15 and following. And he also reminds them of the sacrifices that are to be made. And of his continued presence and help as they follow him and obey his will. Did you notice what we have on the sign, on the other side of the sign now? Anybody notice what George put up there for me? We didn't even have room for the scripture reference because there were so many words there. So we had to take the reference off because they were squeezed too close together. But it's part of the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. It's the very last words of it where Jesus said, And I will be with you always to the very end of the world. Jesus told his disciples to go out and preach the gospel. 
but he didn't tell them to go alone. He didn't tell them to do it under their own power and strength. He said, wait in Jerusalem until you're filled with the Holy Spirit, until you're endued with power from on high. But he told them, go and baptize and teach and teach them all, teach all the things that I have told you to observe and baptize and so on. And then he said, I will be with you always to the very end of the age or to the end of the world. As long as you live, in other words. And that promise is not just to those original 11, because Judas had betrayed him and was gone, but it wasn't just to those original apostles, those original disciples. It's to us too. When we go in His name, when we preach the gospel, when we feed His sheep, when we do what He's called us to do, He goes with us. Aren't you glad? Amen. Amen. He doesn't send us out to the wolves unprotected or unprepared. He goes with us. Peter, who had failed Jesus by denying Him three times, is reminded to feed the sheep, to feed Jesus' lambs in this next section of Scripture from verse 15 on. John lived to an old age but, but became a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. Now we don't know about all of the disciples but some of you may have read Fox's Book of Martyrs and I would encourage you to get it and read it if you haven't ever read it. it tells about how all the disciples became martyrs for Jesus Christ. Christians in most periods of time in this world have been persecuted. We live in a country where we have basically, for our, most of our lifetime, been free from very much persecution. But it's increasing, and it may come to us too. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in his time, when he, in one of the letters that he wrote, he said, Yes, and all who live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That was his understanding of the Christian life. He said everyone who lives a godly life and lives for Jesus is going to be persecuted. And Jesus said it himself. He said the world will hate you. He said in this world you will have troubles, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. If you follow Jesus, it's not going to always be roses. It's not going to always be prosperity. It's not going to always be good health. There are going to be troubles too. Anyone here who's been a Christian very long knows that. You know that the devil comes right along and he keep, keeps at it all of your life. He'll keep tempting you and deceiving you and lying to you and doing everything he can to trip you up and to get you to give up your faith. But Jesus promises to be with us. And so he reminds them of their calling by telling them to throw their net on the other side of the boat and they'll catch some fish. And they did. And he cooks a meal for them to show them that he will take care of them. And he sends them out and says, I'm going to be with you always. You will never be alone. When you go out doing things for God, you're never alone. You may be by yourself, humanly. Now it is nice to go in twos. That's the biblical pattern. But if you go by yourself, you're not alone because Jesus is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. There's an old song that I, I love. It says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Some of you may have heard of the great missionary James Elliot. He went as a missionary to South Africa. He worked among cannibals, among people who were very primitive. And he died at the hands of natives in South America. But his wife continued to give the gospel to those people. And some of the families of those, and even some of those very people who put him to death came to know Jesus later on because they didn't give up. And because his wife continued to love them and care for them. Here's what he said. You've probably read it before. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jesus said, if you hold on to the things in this world, you're going to lose them eventually. Because you can't keep them forever. You can't take anything with you out of this world. You're going to leave everything behind. 
but you can take your faith with you. You can take your earthly treasure, your heavenly treasures with you. You can lay them up in heaven, and you can, and you will have treasures in the future, even if you don't have them here in this life. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And so I encourage you, live in obedience to God's will, and whether you live many years or only a few, you will live a meaningful and fulfilling life. It's not how long you live, it's how well you live. It's what you do for God that will count and will matter. In the walk to Emmaus, that is a part of a, of a spiritual retreat in the Methodist, United Methodist Church. And I've been on that retreat, it's, and it's, it's moving, it's powerful. At the end of it, at the commitment time, there's a statement made. It says, you're counting on Christ. And I don't remember exactly how it said, but it says something like, you're counting on Christ, can Christ count on you? And I ask you that this morning. You're counting on Jesus. You want him to help you, don't you? Can he count on you?